August 2nd, 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. A coalition force was amassed. February 17th, the air war began. Je February 24th, the ground war began. The ground war and everything was over in a hundred hours. Now, there's a hell of a lot more to it than just that. And as a matter of fact, we have a look at that. Let's, let's come down because some people thought, well, this is a video game war. You know, some of the comments were made, I think, were, were from the media and for people that weren't there. And, um, and we have so many uh, war veterans that come over and help us at Aquino. And a number mm -hmm. of you guys are online right now on this call. So the coalition forces were led by General Norman Schwarzkopf, known as Storm and Norman. He basically amassed 670,000 troops. Well, 425,000 of them were American. And they were from about 28 countries. Now, the primary goal was to defend Saudi Arabia and then expel Iraq from Kuwait. So just to give a sense of scope here, this force was larger and putting it together was much more complex than D-Day. And a lot of people don't realize the scope of this thing. This was a, a huge, the, the most massive air campaign the world had ever seen. It was over 3,000 aircraft that went up against the Iraqi army. So but when we look back and we say 30 years, let's talk, let's go back and look at 30 years ago today. January 23rd, 1991. Look at the headlines here. Here's the headline from the Miami Herald. Scud slams Tel Aviv. I don't know. Can you, I don't know. Is this? Yeah, you can see it. Yeah. You can see yeah. it? Okay. Because I don't see myself. Scuds, three Israelis die as Patriots uh, miss missile. The Patriot anti-missile system couldn't get all the scuds. There was another one from the New York Times. Iraqi sets oil refineries afire as allies step up air attacks. Missiles pierce Tel Aviv shield. <clears throat> 30 years ago today. Three die, 96 are hurt uh, in Israeli suburbs. Um... the news today 30 years ago okay let's go back to the beginning and what I'd like to do is talk about it and I'd like some of you guys to share your experiences with us so on August 2nd as I said Iraq invaded Kuwait tiny little Kuwait rich rich oil country and uh, Saddam in Iraq had a massive debt from his war with Iran so he was looking to expand, to say the least. The U.S. sent in the USS Independence into Saudi Arabia. It had 86 fighter aircraft. This is their initial response. Soon the numbers grew to 100,000. They called themselves the speed bump because that's about all it would be. Saddam had massed up all his troops now along the border between Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. So there's a massive threat there that he was going to go in and take over. Saudi Arabia as well, again, for the oil, for the power. We're all watching this stuff. The UN passed sanctions demanding that Iraq withdraw. They didn't do it. They wouldn't do it. Everyone was watching. I was sitting on the edge of my seat at home watching this stuff. I could only imagine what you guys were, were, were thinking, those of you that did go over. So by Christmas, there was 650,000 troops there. Like, I guess what I'd like to ask is, you guys were, I think most of you guys from the UK were sitting in, uh, in Europe or in, in, in England and your bases, um, and you were watching this. You probably knew that as Britain committed to, to getting involved, that, that you could be. Now, not everyone was called over, but you could be over. Um, I see Les, you've, you've got off work. Welcome. Good to see you. Um, Les, where were you? when this yeah. news rolled out? Um, 
We was in Munster. Uh, we'd not been in Munster long. Uh, we got there in 88, so that was our first time on the Challenger. So really, we spent the first year just shaking down on Challenger and getting used to the new tanks and tactics. Um, when that kicked off, um, and there was a commitment from the government to put land forces in, I think the general consensus within our particular regiment that it might have only been um, like recce, uh, being easy to move than what Ch uh, Levy Armour was. Um, and then they decided to put 7 Brigade in. Um, we was a little bit miffed at the time um, because the Scots DGs and the Queen's Royal Irish had not been back in Germany long um, on Challenger, whereas out of the two, out of the three armoured regiments, we was a more, I won't say proficient, but we was a more up-to-date using them because we've been in Germany since 1988. Um, so we was quite happy uh, come November when they decided to commit another brigade, uh, which was 4th four Brigade. Um, didn't give us much time to get the vehicles back together again because it was all in bits and pieces. Um, we lost three quarters of our tanks, gained them, gained the equivalent back again, but had to rebuild them from scratch and it only gave us about six weeks to do that. Um, we was working 24 hours a day, seven days a week to rebuild them. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Les. Uh, George, George Clegg. Hi there, Al. Good. How you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. You're looking good, Al. So are you. I love your map <laughs> in the background. That's pretty cool. You guys are real high tech. I'm still living in a in an office. No, I Germany's like your background. In the middle of the desert. <laughs> <laughs> so, George, what do you remember when you got the word about you guys heading over there? Well, uh, as Les said, you know, the initial uh, the initial thoughts would be, right, let's get some stuff in there quick, light forces. And then the decision was made to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, stand up 7 Brigade. And 7 Brigade <laughs> needed a medium recce squadron to go with them. And uh, as we were the sort of one div um, or uh, what the one div medium recce regiment, they decided that uh, a squadron QDG would accompany 7 Brigade uh, out there. Uh, and basically, as Les has already alluded to, it's absolutely frantic um, sort of uh, experience of getting those vehicles ready, repainting them, getting all the kits sorted out, making sure that all the systems on board, particularly the NBC systems, were all up and working, that you could actually deploy your vehicle and it would be airtight, um, because clearly there was a lot of threat of Saddam using chemical weapons. But as Les has said, mm -hmm. it was frantic, absolutely, let's get the vehicles ready. Uh, and the vehicles were got ready. The uh, 7 Brigade basically drove all their vehicles up to Bremerhaven docks um, on tank transporters, and they all went on an, a vast array of ships. Our um, vehicles went on a rusting old um, sort of tramp steamer called the Macandian Queen that broke down, I think, several times, once in the Suez Canal en route. Um, and a couple of guys were on board there frantically trying to keep all the equipment, the A Squadron equipment, um, working. Um, so I then flew out with the advance party um, from RAF Guttersloe to Al Jabail, uh, and we sort of waited there for the rest of the squadron and the vehicles to arrive. Um, but like I say, it was you didn't really have time to think at this stage. Um, like I say, on deployment, let's get the kid over there. Um, really a, a buzz of excitement. Um, everybody at the top of their game, really, um, in terms of uh, uh, where they were and what they were doing. And like I say, at this stage, September, October, 7 Brigade were the main effort. And to be honest, everybody was stripping stuff out of all the other regiments that were in um, British Army Germany at the time and in the UK to make sure that those tanks had spares, you know, they were ripping final drives out of tanks and all over the place to make sure that uh, um, everybody deployed with the correct kit and equipment. And so 7 Brigade, main effort. So that's it on deployment so far, Alan. Good stuff. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Bob, Bob DeLow. 
Yep. Buddy. You, there? you got me. Are you there, Bob? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, there you go. How you doing, Bob? I'm all right. Okay. Good. Bob, you yep. went over with the yep. Canadian contingent. And if, if correct me if I'm wrong, and just bring everyone up to speed. Canada's, we didn't have ground forces per se. We had uh, fighter aircraft that participated in the air war. We had ships in the, in, in the, uh, the Red Sea and around the, the, around the area. Um, and we had a massive field hospital, if I'm not mistaken, built uh, that thank God we didn't really have to use. Um, but I understand you were involved with scud hunting. Yeah, I was. I was, uh, I was sitting in Riyadh and uh, we were uh, we were supposed to be underground, but that never happened. We were pretty uh, pretty much above ground in a something like a tent, but a little bit thicker, and uh, that's where we that we worked out of from the time the war started to to the time uh, time it ended. And by the way, we did that infantry over there. There was some ground forces there, but they were uh, protecting the airfields and and protecting the hospital. Okay, good. Thanks. Where were you when you got word you were heading over? I was in Ottawa in a place called uh, the, the Department of Imagery Exploitation, and it was totally a total surprise because they just like they walked in the door and said, "Go home, have a couple of days off. You're going places." <laughs> so <laughs> that was all there was to it. It was, you know, voluntold. No question. When you flew that. into Riyadh, uh, well, actually, we flew uh, we flew from Canada by Boeing to uh, with a with uh, to uh, Bahrain and then from Bahrain by Herc to uh, to King Kilad military airfield and then the Americans bust us and trucked us down with our kit to Riyadh and we we're right on the airfield at Riyadh with them just a couple hundred meters from uh, from the actual uh, airfield itself. Okay could you describe what you were doing with respect to the satellite imagery and things? I was uh, we were just uh, hunting for targets and uh, and uh, getting getting familiar with the place or well, targets getting familiar with our targets and stuff like this here, and the we did hunt for scuds. That was pretty much the main main focus of what we had to do. But we were also uh, uh, looking for defensive positions. Well, they they weren't hard to find. Minefields they were easy to find because the wind kept shifting and you could plot them. Uh, you know, and targets and a lot of bomb damage assessment what we did so but oh wow yeah. okay i remember reading that uh, the scuds pose such a threat not numerically a threat but almost ideological threat uh, because they they were pre predominantly aiming at israel uh, and they well, tried to get the israelis to attack so that it would mess up the coalition because we did have some Arab nations as part of the coalition that weren't too Israeli friendly. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, they, uh, Schwarzkopf had almost a third of his air force, rather than bombing the ground troops, he, they were out chasing scuds. So you must have, did you look at any before and after? Like if you identified a, a scud location, would you actually, um, uh, look at after a bombing to see if you guys had hit it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was kind of interesting because all of the, the Americans were thinking that all the uh, the scuds are hiding in the large culverts that were underneath a lot of the Iraqi and Kuwaiti highways, or Iraqi highways, I guess. There was massive uh, culverts there for that uh, anything can hide in there. And there were, the Americans are going by and laser bombing every one of those culverts. They were, <laughs> they, they would uh, fly over and then drop a couple bombs or a bomb in the middle of it there just to make sure there was nothing inside it because I'm sure they would have found out in a hurry. But there was there was a lot of uh, scuds out in the out in the well I wouldn't say a lot of scuds out in the out in the western part of the western desert but we knew where their launchers were and uh, and uh, Saddam's goal there was to uh, attack the Israelis and get them to uh, to get into the war and hope that the uh, that the uh, Allied uh, or the uh, Arab coalition would uh, would turn against Shortsquaff. 
because the Israelis had entered the war, but that never happened. Thank God for that. So, I think yeah. Rob's absolutely right there. I think the, the the political ramifications of Israel joining in would have been quite considerable. So that's why m so much time and effort was spent looking for the scuds in a strategic sense. Clearly, on a battlefield set sense. Um, that would would have been the principal mechanism. They would have delivered any uh, NBC, CBRN type uh, uh, a agents and what have you. Mm. Rob's absolutely right. It's the the political bit um, that made the scuds so important. That you know, trying to keep Israel out of Buddy. the war, so they didn't uh, uh, um, sort of get any, anything back from the Arab Ar Arab nations. Yeah, Good. it's just a lot of a uh, couple of the pilots came back and they were they were. Uh, they had actually had that. We could watch, seen a launch, and actually one guy, one guy had a scud fly right by him, I mean, like come off the ground and, and fly up and just. Well, I wouldn't say just missed his airplane, but he was within a couple of miles of it. He knew it was there, you know. So, so. And he missed it. <laughs> it was, just missed it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He was, All right. He missed. He seen it coming. Well, I guess, but uh, you know, it had just launched and it hadn't gone up the maximum velocity yet, but it was still on its way up, and. Uh, yeah, he was excited about that. <laughs> I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Bob. Okay. Um, if we move on now from the, from when we got land, we landed, and then you actually had the, the, the air campaign beginning, and that went on for quite some time. And uh, I think uh, Schwarzkopf was hoping to finish them all off uh, without, get, without moving to a ground assault. He was hoping that they would... Uh, that they would end up surrendering. Ah. And I think there were some negotiations going on at the time. I would like to note, though, it's really interesting because it was the first time they, I think they used stealth in combat. And uh, they really weren't sure when they sent, when they first went in on that airstrike on Baghdad, they didn't know whether they were going to lose those stealth bombers or how effective they were going to be or how effective Saddam's uh, whole radar and any aircraft uh, uh, defense defenses were. So... When this whole thing started, like when you guys were sitting in your positions, like could you see or hear any of this ground war? Or sorry, not the ground war, the air war. I mean, did you? Oh, God, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Al. Uh, I, I mean, say, but by this time, the whole of the British force had moved from the Al Jabal area um, and covertly moved uh, west into the Wadi Al Batin area. And, and basically, we were all sort of sat in high positions. The whole of one British Corps uh, was sat in high positions. Uh, and it was a bit like um, sort of dummy forces in D-Day. Saddam knew that basically wherever the British were was likely to be the main effort because politically they're not going to send the Brits over there to do a little bit of a diversionary attack. They wanted basically he knew that wherever the Brits were, they would be part, they wouldn't be the main effort, but they would be part of the main effort. And so basically that move to the West was kept sort of uh, undercover. So Saddam didn't know where the one British Corps were. And we were all sort of sat in high positions in the Wadi Al Albertin, and you could hear the aircraft going across and you could see in the, in the sort of distance the, the results of what they were doing. And also at the same time, and you've got some screenshots of it there, um, the, the, the coalition artillery was sort of driving forward up to the berm, firing their missiles and then pulling back to the um, uh, uh, pulling back into the uh, hide areas at the same time. So there was a lot going on here, but you're absolutely right. Um, and I don't know if the others um, remember it, but you could absolutely see the aircraft going across, particularly all the bombers, stealth bombers and what have you. Um, unbelievable sight. Okay, thanks. Matt, yeah. Matt, Matt I think, um, Hey, Al. Hey, how you ah. doing, Matt? Matt? All the better for seeing you. Ah, uh, to see you wearing <laughs> the, your new suit. Good to see it. So tell me. <laughs> Are you, I think you started chiming in there. Do you remember seeing the air war going? Um, from what I remember, I can't actually recall them going over. Well, any of the you sounds? Hear, Did you hear any of the bombings? You could, like, you could hear them because they were going in at such a height. I mean, these were sort of like a, really way up there. 
And what they were doing, boom. But I actually, and in fact, um, some of the daisy cutters that were being dropped, we could hear those exploding in the distance. <laughs> They'd we, shake we, the ground. I oh. wanted to ask someone, uh, George, you had mentioned that, um, that the artillery would come forward to your positions closer to the burn and then they would, would, would fire and then back up. But did the, was the artillery going when the air war was going? Yeah, uh, well, just towards the, uh, clearly towards the, um, uh, um, before the 24th of February, there was a period um, sort of, uh, so the air war had started and we were sort of, I don't know, halfway, three quarters into the air campaign and before the land campaign started where we went across, where all the coalition forces, artillery assets them, went forward, let loose and then come back. So I don't know, probably yeah. the exact date to be confirmed, but with effect from something like, I don't know, the 10th of February. Um, the artillery raid started okay. taking place. Okay, George, great. Hey. On that note... Hey, Al, am I live on this? You are, Sean. Good to see hey, you. Sean. Good hey. to see you. Sean, let me go back yeah. to... Let me go to Reggie for a sec. We'll come back to you, Sean. Reggie. Okay. Hi. Reggie Campbell, where are you? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Reggie, we're, we were talking the other day. You were telling me that the, the British artillery with those launchers... They would come right up beside you, launch, yeah. and they then they get like <laughs> then they get the heck away from you fast, so that the counter artillery wouldn't get them, and yet they were right by you, and you didn't withdraw. Yeah, they they probably didn't even know we were there because we were the MBC screen right up the front, and where they're pulling forward to fire, they would probably not even be told that we were in the. The local as such hey, because we were. Lock, Reggie? What? Yeah, I'm down. Out... I'm down by the river. <laughs> Very nice. There, so uh, down by Reggie, the river, Hamble. Sean, Sean Bannister, how you doing? Hey, hey, Al, how you doing? All right. <laughs> hey, who's this young lad in the back end of uh, that striker? Look at that. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. You. That was packed out to the gills. That uh, extra yeah. missiles, everything. I think there's another one where you're not too packed down to the gills. Do we have that one, Jeremy? There's oh, look at that. The, yeah, that's the FUP. That, that was uh, uh, red or something, uh, area red, I think. So or, this is just prior keys. to going, just before. Yeah, yeah, just practicing. Yeah. Practicing a lineup, that was. Oh, ready was to go. Just, okay. Uh, funny enough, well, on that one, uh, Alan, that previous photograph, the Warriors <laughs> to my... To my Right on that photograph. Yeah. Um, the warriors to the right. We were talking to the crews, and one of the crews was later killed by the A-10 by accident. Oh wow! Yeah, I remember it distinctly because we had had a good conversation with them, and then they got they got uh, taken on a blue on blue incident not long after. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it was, that was Royal pretty Welsh. Nasty. Yeah, Let's see but that I, just going picture. back to just the two things I wanted to mention was uh, first of all the Scud issue. I distinctly remember the day that the Scud dropped in Riyadh. I think it was Riyadh. Um, and the yep. Ferrari that, that that caused uh, yep. politically. And uh, the fact that the, that the Scud, when I saw the videos and photographs of it, looked like something out of a Thunderbirds outfit. I mean, it was a, just a, like a 1960s missile. It was so outdated. And, of course, yep. the Americans then brought in the, uh, the anti-Scud rocket system, uh, I can't remember what it was Patriot. called. Patriot. 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 That's the one, yeah. Uh, and that had a big impact politically. Uh, and the other thing, when you were talking about the guided missiles or the guided systems that the Americans were using, and you can remember Schwarzkopf with his TV briefings, he used to love showing, uh, you know, the truck crossing the bridge and then the bomb coming in. Um, so they really pushed that, that sort of uh, thing politically. Um, from our perspective, or I say from my perspective, because I, I was just a corporal, really, um, we didn't really care about any of that. But my biggest concern was that they'd stop it before we got to war. Um, that was my biggest fear at the time. Oh, really? Yeah, someone yeah, just mentioned a... about, uh, about the Scud. Uh, someone just posted that the Scud basically was a uh, modified German V2. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. really. It was, about, it was really old-fashioned stuff. About as accurate. 
It wasn't. Yeah, I mean, at all. I mean, it dropped. It dropped out of the sky in Riyadh like a like a, a bag of cement. You know, I, I mean, I don't think it did any damage, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was. Well, um, it, I think psychologically, it, killed, it did a lot of damage. It killed quite a few, and that it, it hit the barracks, and that was just out of luck because it sure as hell you just aim to a city, you don't yeah, aim right. to a location. L. Yes. That, uh, that that scud never hit uh, Riyadh. It was uh, was farther east than Riyadh. But although having said that, though we still got twenty eight of them at at, at Riyadh, Riyadh, and uh, one of them actually the the airframe of one of them that was hit by a by a Patriot actually hit the uh, the uh, apron on the airfield about maybe half a kilometer kilometer away from where we were. Well, well desert that. terms. When when I say Riyadh in desert terms. Uh, you know, you're talking about the nearest city within a hundred mile because you know there's, there's very rarely names for the places. Well, they probably yeah. aimed at Riyadh. What, what they hit where they hit. That's that's. Oh, yeah, the... they, were, they weren't accurate at all. They were hit and miss. They were more used more like for as a terror weapon than they were anything else. So, for sure, sure, for sure. sure. Well, what I wanted to ask you guys, I mean. Obviously, those of you that were stationed in Saudi Arabia, I'm not sure about you, uh, Bob. Uh, you were, you said you were down in. So where I, were you? I was actually in. I was actually in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia for the whole war. You were actually in there. Yeah. Like, was that no alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> was there no alcohol there? Well, kind of story. Kind of. Kind now, of you story. guys, you guys have shared with me over the years how creative you were. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot of things we could talk about, but we'll just stick to alcohol. Now, yeah, look at, look at the a lot of up that we're room. showing now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's the old um, Shimuli bottle or container. Shimuli, and, uh, yeah, Shimuli is a, a, a flare system, a handheld okay. flare system. But the gray, the gray bottle, if you like, is the Shimuli container that they come in. Yeah. Um, which is which is what airtight and watertight so we used to uh remove that keep the bottle and then we would make our home brew out of um cans of fruit from the ration packs uh and then we would put it in there a bit of water a couple of yeast tablets and then we would make you know the tubing that the driver's uh washer system uses on the cvrt yeah yeah we used to get that put it in the hole in the in the top and then make an airlock in, in the pipe system so uh, it could ferment uh, and, and vent air but there's nothing going in the other way um, uh, and then we used now, to now vent, venting Sean clearly was something yes, that I, picked up I was after. going to come on to that so shut up George right. <laughs> <laughs> so so we used to bury it in strategic locations and try and get a grid or a marking point which wasn't easy in the desert but <laughs> <laughs> other other people used to put them into the black jerry cans on the side of the vehicles uh, without a suitable venting system, like George. Um, and <laughs> unfortunately, having failed to take into account the venting system, uh, we would then get jerry cans blowing up on a regular basis because uh, <laughs> obviously they'd expand beyond their capabilities and then they'd explode. Um, so you'd, I'm, I'm you'd just saying the, the Saudis aren't daft though, because if you go to a Saudi supermarket, they have got shelves and shelves of alcohol-free beer, alcohol-free wine, and the yeast tablets that Sean's talking about are in the shelf next to the alcohol-free beer. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of an unwritten law there, and 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 basically our SQMS, the quartermaster sergeant, was when he went on his trips to the uh, uh, supermarket, was told to bring back crates and crates of alcohol-free <laughs> beer, which we put into those jerry cans with a venting system <laughs> after, and then chucked in the yeast tablets just to give it a little bit of uh, uh, alcohol and fermentation. Uh, the other thing, uh, which is probably not well known, Al, was that uh, we used to get invited to go and stay a night with the expatriates uh, that lived over there when when the opportunity arose, usually once a month in the preceding days to February. Um, and because they were all gas engineers and oil engineers, their garages were full of were full of stills, so so they <laughs> yeah. all brew their own gear. And and the strength of it was would basically melt metal. I mean, it was you'd have to cut it ten times with water before you could cut it with a. Yeah. You know, it was scary stuff. Yeah. I think it was called Sadiq. 
I think it was called Sadiq, and I think Rob might know better, but I think Sadiq is the Arab word for welcome. And you used to go to these cellars and you'd say, uh, well, what would you like, mate? And I'll say, um, a gin and tonic, please. So it was Sadiq and tonic. And what do you want? I'll have a whiskey and Coke. It was Sadiq and Coke, you know. So Sadiq <laughs> filled the whole gambit of every single um, spirit that you could possibly think of. I like your map, George. <laughs> all right okay so the ground assault begins the ground assault lasts 100 hours um i'm wondering like did it seem fast i mean like like were you up the whole time like was it one big adrenaline rush or like what was it 72 hours without sleep i had 72 hours without sleeping once. I, I can remember standing up and sleeping for sort of like 10, 15 minutes whilst we were driving along. And uh, and I remember sort of coming to my consciousness and thinking, I must have been asleep then. Uh, but the adrenaline was, the excitement, it wasn't, it wasn't fear, it was excitement. And it was all, the biggest fear I had was not being able to keep up with the tanks because the challenges were racing ahead of us. And we were supposed to be the recce screen, so we were really trying to push to get ahead of them. And uh, they constantly kept on taking over us. Uh, so, so that was my biggest fear. But there was no fear of the enemy as such. Jim Lindsay, are you there? Jim? Oh, I thought I saw Jim sign uh, Yeah. Up. Hi, Alan. How are you? Hey, good. Good to see you. Um, um, good to see you too. Long time no see. Five years, Alan. Five years. Jim, you're, the ferret's still over here. To remind everyone, Jim was the driver. There's his picture. Yeah. He got a, yeah, a little little more hair on his face. And uh, uh, we he's have... still as ugly, though. He's still as <laughs> ugly. Cheers, lad. And uh, I'm not sure, is Josh on board? Yeah, Josh is here somewhere. Okay, good to see you, Josh. There's There's Josh and Jim right there. They were there's in the there's a picture of the rat there, look, as well. Still got it. There he is. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> we have that, for all of you that may not be aware, we have the very ferret. Our Gulf War ferret is the ferret they had in the Gulf War. I, that was in Belgium. It came over to England. I scooped it up. Luckily, it, just by luck, I got it. And uh, it's been restored to the way it was. It's still running really good, guys. It's waiting for you to come back. I tell you what, when I saw that, Alan, five years ago, I proper choked up because I remember leaving that and the docks of Al Jabail. We drove it back down from Kuwait uh, on the back. It came on the back of a, a low loader, a, a local Saudi low loader. And um, it drove off and it, it just sort of like shat its guts and died just as I pulled it up into the docks. The batteries caved in, but it survived the whole thing. A lot of them, the, the, the fluid couplings, the clutch mechanism went, um, started to pack up in Saudi because of the soft sand, it couldn't cope too well. But as we yeah. moved further north and we went west into Iraq or up onto the Iraqi border there, the ground was a lot harder, a lot compact. And, you know, we could keep up with the challenges and the track Eddie. vehicles pretty, pretty good and sometimes go a little bit quicker. So um, how, how many months did you live sleeping beside that vehicle? Uh, Josh and I, well, it was a bit of a funny story because we, we were so like, we were a different regiment. We were... Uh, we weren't the 14th with the four, we were attached to the 1420th. Josh and I were in the fifth Royal and Skilling Dragoon Guards. You can see on the pennant there. Yeah. And yeah. We'd just not long come back from Northern Ireland. I had the summer off, and then all the nonsense kicked off in Kuwait City or in Kuwait there. And one, I'd just taken over as the Sant Major. I was a young trooper, and I'd taken over as the Sant Major's yeah. ferret driver. So I was qualified, and Josh would I'm be a troop that, leader then. And we were sort of like mobilized and. And, and off we went to join him with the 1420th. And just before Christmas, we did all the build-up training. He said, oh, you're no longer required. The job's changing. So we, we had a bit of leave, and this was just before Christmas. And I was just leaving the camp to ready to go home to, to, to go back to the UK for a bit of Christmas leave. And he said, no, stop. You've got another job now. You, you, you're going to, you are going back out. So we eventually arrived, picked up the ferret there, and after a, sort of, a bit of a sort of disjointed lots of confusion and we, we married up and we ended up going with a squadron initially we were with d squadron and we were the uh, like the sergeant major's wingman liaison officer so we were like a little taxi 
for the squadron leader and we did all sorts of jobs. We ran we ran signal cable back from the squadron back to battle group headquarters and things like that. And actually during the war, we were sort of like with the reserve troop, as it were, as the intimate support troops going up. And we actually ended up driving onto the objectives with with the dismounted infantry, along with the Remy and the ambulance crews and everything. So it was quite not conventional, but quite sort of like um, quite exciting in an op open top Mark One Cabriolet ferret there. Not a lot of protection, as you can see. <laughs> no MBC protection, not much from, you know, a bit of small arms, it'd ping off it sort of thing. But yeah, it was a good old battle truck. It kept us safe. And um, it, it, it does my heart good to see it still going, Alan. Well done, mate. Uh, it's still going. It's waiting for you to come back. So, Stu Craddock, are you there, Stu? Yes, I am, Alan. How you doing? Good, Good, thanks. Good to see you. So, Stuart, you, you spent your time with, was it, um, with uh, Jeremy Denning? Yeah, and Billy Stafford. Yeah, I'm not sure if Billy's on today or not, but what do you remember? Like, could you, uh, you rolled in with the 14th, 20th, I saw video, I saw video, um, were you the driver? I'm yes. Yeah. 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 I saw a video of, of, of it going. It's a pretty fuzzy video, and it was taken from a Challenger, and you're just to the left of that Challenger, just booting ahead of it. Um, what, could you share some comments about uh, uh, what you remember that the day you guys crossed the burn and went into Iraq? Basically, I remember um, being told by Jeremy that we we're going now, so we just had, oh, took it in our step, and then we we aimed for the berm to cross over. Oh, Stu! Hello. And do you remember going past the sign, Stu? The big yeah. red one. Welcome, yeah. <laughs> big red one welcomes you to Iraq. Remember it well. <clears throat> I remember being never as tired as I've ever been in my entire life. I remember that. What sort of time? What sort of time did you go across, Stu? Well, what we would come. We we saw like went with the the bit the, the A vehicle went through one lane, and the B vehicles went through another lane. And God knows how, but Josh and I ended up. We ended up. I don't know where we ended up. We were sort of like one minute we were the, sort of like the Royal Scots, then we were with the Fusiliers, <laughs> and then we were sort of like up with sort of like the recce screen somewhere because we got completely <gasps> lost. And eventually, you know, after driving around in the dark, you know, you saw like Josh would hang out the top right, you know, where's A Squadron 1420th? Oh, about 15 Ks over that way. Because we had no maps or nothing, no GPS. And it was just sort of like drive around and bumble into people until you found out where you were. And eventually we found the squadron. But for crossing the berm for us, uh, we actually crossed in the daylight and it was sort of like it was gone. It was all leveled. You know, there was a few destroyed vehicles there. There was sort of like the engineers had it all squared away. And it was like a motorway for us, so there was nothing really, you know, you could call call an obstacle there, to, to, to be fair. It was only sort of like when we were getting onto the objectives, some of those were bermed up round the edges, and they were a little bit tricky to get onto and get round. And, you know, the old ferret had a bit of a wheel spin on a few places and stuff. And we ended up losing the signal reels off the back, because I think it was, uh, I think a D squadron leader, I think, in the end, had to shove us off the top of the berm because we got stuck. But, and he crunched all the signal rolls at the back, which was quite a relief for me because that meant I didn't have to carry on winding out wire all the way back to our, H our HQ when we stopped. But <laughs> yeah, well, was, I mean, uh, say it, it seemed to be par for the course because if you ask Sean, he had his map taken off him, didn't he, Sean? <laughs> yes, I did, and I'm not happy. <laughs> <laughs> but there was no on the maps. I remember, you know, there was, you know, you either had to go by dead reckoning or nothing. There was no features, no nothing, or there's well, like, you know. Can I can I just say something on that, Tim? <clears throat> what, what George refers to there, Al, is that uh, the night before we uh, went through the breach, um, I, I've, re I've just recently written this, that's why I know it's up to date, but uh, uh, the night before we went through the breach, I had this map that I'd been uh, working on for a, quite some time where it had every marking on it. I was sneaking around the int uh, warrant officer and uh, trying to gain information and I had every known position that we could find marked on that map and uh, the evening before the squadron leader came along uh, and he knew that I was a bit of a map spotter anyway and he said uh, call Barris there let me have a look at your map so I showed him the map very proudly and uh, he went that's brilliant he said I'll give that to the forward air controller 
and he took the bloody thing off me. <laughs> <laughs> Gave my map to him, and I had nothing. So, so I went and got some old maps that weren't even from our region, and I turned them over, drew a load of grid lines on them, uh, with a reference to where we were and what grid we were starting at. And I used that. And you know what? As Jim just said, it didn't really make much difference as long as you knew where north was and you went in a straight line as you needed to. Um, you know, what, like what was the sat nav we had there? Was it Trimpack or Trimble or Trimble. something? Trimble. 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 And it, it used to go out of sync, as I remember. It would go out of sync a couple of hours every day. Yeah, because the satellites... I remember when we were down. moving up through the staging areas just before, just before we crossed the berm... I can't remember the little town that we ended up in. Completely lost. And the RSM was leading the package. It, were all, it was all the ferrets. We were all moving together. So the RSM was in charge. He was he was taking us along. And all the Sarp Majors and Nellos and the Rebro ferrets. And I mean, we're all in this little package moving on. And we ended up in this bloody town. And, you know, on the, on the Saudi-Iraqi border. It, it, up there, it was not far from the, the wadi there where we were all leagued up in, in, in Afal Batin. <laughs> And I was like, Guys, well, this can't be right. And the RSM's like, you know, completely and utterly lost, relying on this sat nav that sort of like, you know, was telling him we we're in sort of like, I don't know, Florida somewhere, because it certainly weren't bloody Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Did you guys see the actual fires burning, the oil wells? That oh, yeah. 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 When, yeah. when we all, when we leaguered up at, at the end, it was like orange and black rain for, 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 for weeks. You know, you could see it, all the cloud after the war had finished. And it was when it rained, it's like, can you remember, Les, all the sort of like, all the water, it was like dirty rainwater on one, it, 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 yeah. it you know, it, oh, it was horrible. Yeah, yeah. You, you took the wagons and you was wiping slimy oil off them, it got everywhere, it was in your food, in your drinks, everywhere, you just couldn't get out of it, away from it. Well, the, uh, the 16th, 5th and the A Squadron QDG principal sort of engagement was uh, against mm. objective lead. Um, which was, I think, was on the sort of second day. Um, and basically, we'd gone forward to the objective um, in the night. And then you were expecting, you know, the light to come up in the morning. And it didn't. You know, so we were all that basically the whole of the 16th, 5th and uh, uh, A Squadron QDG had sort of done. Uh, we're, we're just to the west of objective lead. And we're bringing down hell on it in all, sh all, all different ways, shapes or forms. And as the morning progressed, it just didn't get any lighter because of the, all the oil fires that created this complete cloud of uh, 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 black, black smoke uh, across the whole of the sky. And it satellite was a, images showed a that. Real sur really surreal. You saw that in satellite images, too, uh, in a big way. Let's talk about the POWs. There must oh, have been, I see pictures of massive POWs surrendering uh, and just walking through uh, the vehicles to the rear. But our squadron ma Sergeant Major, Alan, was um, a guy called um, Jim, oh, hang on, it'll come to me in a minute. Jim Broom. What's his name, Les? Jim Broom. Jim, Jim Broom. Jim Broom, yeah. And hadn't he, done, he'd done quite a lot of time with the Sultan of Amman, hadn't he? So he, he, he was so like he could speak a little bit of Arabic. And yeah, when we walked he, about... uh, he, he worked with the uh, Omanis. Uh, That's and he right. Was he, he had his Omani combats. So he looked a little bit. And he could... I remember he, he, <laughs> his, his, his wagon was called Aladu, which means translates from Arabic to the enemy. Jim was a legend because, it, you know, he would come onto the objectives and we we're all sort of, like, you know, popping and thinking about and the infantry were at one side and this, that and the other. And these guys never knew whether to come out the, 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 the trenches or not and they might fire around at a year or two and then the tanks would get a bit excited and, you know, chatter them up with the coaxes and what have you. Then Jim sort of like came on and started hollering in Arabic and they just came out like rats out of the sewer. Hundreds of them crawling yeah, out, yeah. you know. And there'd be sort of like I think five of us, maybe, you know, there's like the Remy crews and stuff are dismounted. And we'd be herding these hundreds of prisoners, you know, in, 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 in to, to the prisoner pen, the direction. And then the RSM, he had his sort of like his prisoner, his prisoner pen set up sort of stuff. You know, and it, it was, it become more of a, towards sort of like, you know, after we'd finished up on, was it Objective Copper South, Les? Yeah. I think was one of the final objectives that we took. And yeah. after sort of like, you know, it become more of a humanitarian mission, I think, really, because yeah. these guys were in absolute clip yeah, state. Yeah, it, it were was because, it, I think it was because the first lot of prisoners we seen, what was giving ourselves up was on the 
morning uh, after we crossed the berm, and to look at them, they'd been they'd been left. They'd not yeah. been given any replenishment whatsoever by the Iraqis. Uh, it was all conscripts, and he was actually glad to give themselves up. But what I did notice with them, though, is that they totally distanced themselves from their officers. Yeah, they massively. Didn't know what to do with them. And there was one, one occasion, I think it was on mid-afternoon on day two, um, we rolled over this position and it was quite misty, <laughs> believe it or not. So we couldn't see that far in front of us. And uh, we've seen these prisoners bobbing up and down. So we jumped off and we was asking them where the officers are. And there was one lad there who spoke quite good English. And he said, they're all hiding. So we said, take us to where they are. So we took us to this bunker and they wouldn't come out. So I told them, I said, tell them to get their asses out here, else there's a phosphorus grenade going in there. They come scuttling out. And the, the lad turned around and says, we don't want now to do with these. The, the, their officers was quite cowardly, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I, did you notice? Like it's, funny, it's, funny, it's funny you should say that uh, about their English, because some of them spoke really good English and you described what they were like and if you can imagine we had this group of uh, uh, Iraqi prisoners coming towards us and as you say a bit of a humanitarian mission handing out jerry cans of water MREs and all that sort of stuff because they hadn't eaten for ages and then this guy came across in ill-fitting combat fatigues and he was wearing patent leather shoes <laughs> and I, I was going I was, he came across and in the biggest Cockney accent, he said, Gordon Bennett, guys, he says, I'm really glad that you're here. And I goes, well, what the hell are you on, mate? And basically what had happened is he he was an Iraqi that had gone across to Baghdad to do a cabaret act. And <laughs> as part of the cabaret act, he literally had been press ganged into <laughs> the army. And he'd gone, he'd been chucked some fatigue, but he hadn't like been you, given George. any boots. Yeah, a bit like me. He, and he hadn't been given any um, <laughs> uh, 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 any boots or anything like that. And he'd been sat on the, the, the sort of border being bombed and blown to, to bits for God knows how long. But uh, it was unbelievable. When he came out with this Cockney accent, Gordon Bennett, guys, I'm really <laughs> glad that you're here. And you're sort of going, what the hell are you doing? And he was he was a Brit, who, well, a British Iraqi who'd been press ganged into the army. But you got wow. the pictures there. That's exactly, yeah. you know, that's wow. exactly what they were like. I remember you're absolutely right. It was a humanitarian mission. I remember one yeah. of the prisoners coming over, you know, in full UK DPM temperate combats with an S10 respirator. And, you know, spoke perfect English, having been trained at Sandhurst. And, you know, he kept all sort of like his 1157 or whatever it was. And someone, you know, someone in the battle group actually knew. He, he mentioned some name. And I think there was another officer who was at Sandhurst with, you know, they, they, they were the same sort of like class at, you know, at, at, at the academy there. You know, bizarre, really. So, you know, you think about it and there was all walks well, of people my, there, my, really. But, my, yeah. cousin, my cousin was a, a mate at... Jim Brooms, uh, Stevie Reds. I don't really remember him, Jim. He was the uh, signals wall in yeah. um, RHQ. Now, he, he served in Oman with uh, Sweepy, so he was a colloquial Arabic speaker as well. And when we finished and I met up with our Steve, <clears throat> he was just tell he was talking about prisoners and he was telling us about this one. And he says, he was an old guy. And he says, when I got to speak to him, he was 68 years of age. And he's come up to me, he said, I didn't go up to him, he said, he'd come running over to me, and he says he was on his hands and knees in tears, crying, tears of gratitude, mm. that they picked him up as a prisoner of war, and that he's getting fed. Yeah. He says, because I'd been involved, they ripped me out, he says, when we had the Iran-Iraq war, he said, they come to my village, he said, they took me out there, he said, I had to fight during the Iran-Iraq war, he said, I went back with my family, he said, years after that, he said, Saddam's troops come along, ripped us all out of the village again and thrown us in the front line. And he said, yeah, they've just left us here. Yeah. And he was, I, that, um, he was that grateful. He gave our Steve his Quran. He said, you take this Quran. He said, this is yours. He said, you've saved my life and I can go back to my family now. Mm. Yeah. Hey, Al. Yes, Mac. Uh, hey, Al. Uh, a couple of my prisoner experiences are very brief. Oh. Um uh, for, I didn't see a great deal of them. I did guard them at one stage for shortly, uh, or briefly rather. Uh, a couple of experiences I had was one being very touched by my operator who gave uh, all his sweets away to them, and they were very grateful for that. Uh, the, 
the one that stands out for me was my driver turned up in a resplendent in an Iraqi set of coveralls with brigadier shoulder boards on and looking very smart. And I said to him, I, I can remember saying to him, I said, hey, you shouldn't be taking the clothes off the prisoners. And he said, I didn't get them off the prisoners. He said, I got it off that dead bloke over there. Oh, so, so he'd taken him off a dead, off, off an Iraqi course, basically. And he was wearing these coveralls with great pride. Um, so, so that didn't go down too well. Uh, and the other thing I remember was that I managed to get off one of the prisoners a nine millimeter browning that was silver uh, plated and fully engraved in Arabic and everything like that. And that was a great collector's mm -hmm. item. Uh, well, and yeah. by, and uh, I assume we're secure hey. on this means. <laughs> but I managed to get it back to Germany. Uh, and then the, the guy who'd, who'd helped me get, get back to Germany, I went to collect it. And uh, he said, oh, I panicked a bit and threw it in the local canal. So I never saw it again. Um, okay, gee. Whether he did or hey. not, I don't know. Gentlemen, let's move. Let's move to the end here. What was the feeling like when it ended? When they said the ceasefire. Let's talk about the ceasefire and then your departure, heading home. It's surreal, Al. Really, it was sort of like, it, what do you mean? It's all over. Is that it? You know, and it was sort of like, as, as quickly as it started. You know, four days earlier, it, it was all over. Our squadron, we'd come to a halt in a in a minefield, and the rules of engagement had changed. And we, we, we were just sort of like stuck in this minefield waiting for the engineers to come and sort of like clear his way out. And we backed our way out. And then I remember sort of like parking up in a squadron leaguer in it, well, in, in a hide sort of like, you know, we we're still in our troop, you know, still ever ready and alert sort of stuff. And getting a proper meal, cooking a proper meal. And then suddenly said, right, get your head down. You get woken up when it's your turn to get on snag. And I remember probably sleeping for nearly a whole day, you know, then sort of like woken up and do your two hour prowl or something and you couldn't go too far from the from outside the league so you're just like a roving sentry uh, because we were still frightened of mines and stuff and no safe routes had been cleared but yeah and it was sort of like you know it it was odd it was a real real funny feeling you know but don't, but don't don't forget there was an, an an expectation that having reached q8 actually the whole of the coalition force was expected to chase the republican guard down and chase them up to basra yeah, and I think there was a political. There was, I, don't, I don't know um, how how accurate this was, but basically there was a thought that the M1 tanks they didn't have enough fuel to complete that particular mission, because we've got a different the challenges or a different engine. Um, basically, we had we had lots of fuel, but the Yanks didn't have enough fuel to let um, their forces continue the movement up to Basra uh, uh, and big sweeping mu movements to take out um, the, uh, the Republican Guard. And also there was a thought, I think politically, that if you completely wiped out the Republican Guard, it would destabilize Iraq completely and real subsequent ops, which potentially were re represented in what happened in uh, the Gulf War II, and you've got the Arab coalition with you as well. You know, you, you, you could only push it so far. Were our, were yeah. our hands not tied in uh, by the United Nations? Because they'd issued their re uh, resolutions. And once those resolutions had been met, they had no option but to sort That's of... Like correct. One description that really stayed with me, and Al, you said right at the front end, this was not a Star Wars sort of uh, a digital war. Mm. I can remember we were transitioning from objective led ready for the chase down to the highway and we were heading in an easterly direction behind a ridge upon which was a complete regiment of m1 tanks with thermal image sites and all, all the other bits and pieces on the ridge to the north of that, that that regiment of m1 tanks was i don't know it must have been a brigade's worth of iraqi armored armored vehicles t-59s now all they had is searchlights and possibly, in a best case, an image intensifier site. And all you could see was the complete regiment of Americans M1s firing at the ridge to their north. And I kid you not, there must have been 60 or 70 flaming hulks on the other ridge. Wow. They, they couldn't see back to shoot at the M1s because clearly as soon as they turned on a searchlight, 
they would have been goners. And the Americans all had image intensifiers, uh, sorry, thermal image sites and what have you. And it, would, it really was t technology, height of technology versus, it wasn't quite Stone Age, but that, that was the sort of uh, 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 the, the, the difference, the key difference. And not one American tank was on fire had not been engaged. 60 flaming hulks on the, on, the, on the ridge to the north of them. They just couldn't find fire back. Unbelievable scene. Talk about this technology. Um, the Iraqi I'll, 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 I'll give you 4,000 tanks. Wow. I'll, I'll give you another example. I'll give you another example of the, uh, the, the psychological warfare that went on. Basically, they had Hercules that used to drop fuel air explosives onto the Iraqi positions. A and, barrack bomb, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And what they used to do is they used to get onto the Iraqi um, company net and go, hello, A company. Um, what I'd like you to do is to look to your left and a Hercules would fly over B company's position and drop the fuel air explosive on them and then say, right, if you don't surrender now, that's going to happen to you. Two seconds later, the whole of A Company would get up and march towards the Allied positions. So there was a lot of psychological warfare going on there as well um, in terms of tuning wow. into their nets, yeah. telling them what was going to happen to them if they didn't surrender, if they didn't <clears throat> surrender, unleashing hell, and then everybody going, clearly, the, the, we're out of our depth here. Yeah, there's a huge there's a huge psyops campaign, you know, with like say with the leaflet drops and everything, and radio broadcasts and stuff, you know, um, and obviously you know they would they would pick up on that, and again it was like reverse psychology as well, because like you going back to the officers and the prisoners, a lot of the officers shed their shoulder titles because they 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 heard you know that barbaric things that we were going to do to them to the officer class, so that was why a lot of them wouldn't sort of like identify themselves, you know. Um, so I think it was on both sides, you know, the psychological warfare, you know, reigned, you know, quite, quite hard. It was quite a let's let's talk about the, the campaign. Effect. Let's talk about the effect of the uh, technology here. I mentioned that about 4000 Iraqi tanks were destroyed and they're talking about 18 Abrams tanks had to be taken out of service, mostly because of friendly fire. No Challenger one tanks were lost to enemy fire at all. And then Challenger 1, uh, they're, they're accrediting approximately 300 Iraqi tanks against right. the Challenger 1. And it's just an interesting, I'm not sure if it still holds today, but the record for the longest distance, tank against tank kill, it goes to the Challenger 1 in the Gulf, the first Gulf War. Was that, uh, was that Coey, two, Les, was it? Young Coey? Three point we should, two, but it was actually a blue on blue, was it, where he shot that? Spartan up on the up in the wadi. No, yeah. that that was that was a squadron. That, that, that was, was a squadron. That was young um, Coey, wasn't it? Yeah, Coey. Yeah, that was yeah. at three. Two, that was at three two hundred. He got he got two bloody Spartans good shot, man. <laughs> two Spartans in one shot. No, but that longest tank to tank kill that was um, down to a seventeen twenty first Lancer crew attached to the Queen's Royal Irish, uh, and that's uh, still a world record at five thousand one hundred meters. Oh. Wow! Yeah, that uh, that was amazing. So all yeah. in all, if, you, if we look back at the whole campaign, for lack of a better term, uh, forty-three days, the coalitions lost about two hundred and forty-five killed. The Iraqis, it's all over the map. You've probably seen in the video that we've been showing. It shows thirty, thirty-five. Some estimates have it at over well over a hundred thousand. Which it would, if you look at some of the bombing and the devastation, I wouldn't be surprised. One third of the casualties were uh, blue on blue. 24 British casualties, nine of them uh, was caused by the Americans, blue on blue. Um, that was the warrior uh, crew with the A 10, wasn't it? From Yeah. But, uh, the, yeah, the staff, they actually, took out, they actually took out two warriors there. Yeah. Okay. Everybody seen. Don't forget, they also took out Queen Darius's Ars Recce trip. Yeah. <laughs> with the M1 at 1,500 metres. Um, everybody walked away with it. George Clark was the actual driver. Hard to believe when you see the hit on it. Yeah. Yeah. Right into the transmission, they, right into the gearbox. Crazy. Quite, quite a horrific. The, the fact that sort of like the, 
the two guys that were badly wounded, um, Barney Bamford and Colin Lynch. Barney was saved because he had his helmet off his head mm-hmm. and was actually resting his arm on it on top of the um, gunner's sight. And a 50 cal round went through his wrist and out through his elbow, stripped him to the bone, basically. And Colin Lynch was down beside the vehicle. He picked up most of the shrapnel and petals mm-hmm. off the actual sort of fin round. So, but everybody survived. So that was a good day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for that kind of hit, for sure. Uh, that, you know, that crew you mentioned earlier on was the, yeah. the, the warrior crew that I spoke to from the Staffordshire's that were alongside us in that forming up at the beginning. Sorry, say that again, Sean. I, I'm saying that that crew from the uh, Staffords and the Warrior were the guys that I was talking to uh, in that forming up prior to going through the breach. Remember I said on that photograph at the beginning? Yeah, yeah. they were, they uh, so were we one spoke of the to those two. guys. They yeah, were one yeah, of the yeah. two that were taken out? Yeah, and the reason That's we spoke right, to yeah. them was because, because one of them in the crew was a Welsh lad. Uh, and he'd, he'd made a fuss because we were obviously QDG next door to them in the in the lineup. Uh, and he came over and we went over there and had a chat with him, blah, blah, blah. And then, as I said, that was the call sign that then got taken out later on. And we were aware of that. Yeah, I, mean, I also remember, I also remember the amount of Lance is stepping on a mine. Does anybody remember that? Uh, on, a, on an anti-personnel mine? Uh, was that on the, was that after the war? Um, yes. Well, yes, that, was that on when they did the, the charity run? It was one of the was that one of the admin group, was it on the on the run that they did that down to the city or something? No, my understanding was it was directly after the war. It was when we were uh, going solid north of um, north of Kuwait City, uh, and we were all told to stay in place. And basically, they were doing some track maintenance or something at Queen's Royal Lancer, and he stood on. I oh, think he stood yeah. on an anti personnel mine. That was the one thing that stuck out in my mind. Did, didn't yeah. someone get hurt with a bomb? Because didn't Jim Broom and that Les they did a run, didn't they? All the yeah, way back no, down to QA for, yeah, for you know what, what that was was when we went firm, um, we had to go out and wrecky the evacuated positions um for any useful information, any vehicle equipment or anything like that. And the engineer recce who was attached to us up until we deployed to the Gulf, uh, was a bloke called Ian Scrivens. And he was mustered, and he was like an eight, a ninth recce car. Well, he got uh, he got shunted up the list, and we got a new engineer recce staff sergeant with us. So we came out this one day, and he went out with Des Hawkins having a look at um, positions. I just got back to our HQ, and there was a no duff message come through. Somebody from recce troops has just been injured. Well, I was panicking then, so I says, "Where is it?" So give us a grid. Went down there. Des stopped us. I said, "What's happened?" He said, that bloody engineer recce staff sergeant, he said, this place is covered with bomblets. He said, so what did he do? He walks up to one and kicked the bleeding that's thing. It. And went that's it. That's the, that's the story, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. He kicked it. Yeah, okay. And do you know what I'm wow. saying? I'll tell you what, Jim, do you know what happened after that? He got a gallantry <laughs> medal for that. Did he? <laughs> I, I, well, I, I, that I, one I, out. J- Josh is online here somewhere, but you, you mentioned going out, Les, and securing sort of like the safe routes back to get back to brigade and all the rest of it. I think Josh and I did similar. We called it like loot, loot and pillage, and we we, we rigged up an old Sankey trailer on a with with a bit of with with a shackle, a, a ten ton shackle or whatever it was, and some some cable. And we used to drag this Sankey trailer around and go out, and we pull we pull all the canvas out the trenches all these big comfy armchairs and settees and stuff and drag them back to the squadron and everything. And we had like souvenirs and rifles and machine guns and God knows what. It was, and like, you know, then everyone's like, oh, can we come out with you sort of stuff? So we'd ram the turret, well, we'd ram everybody into the top of the ferret and we'd go around and drive around all the old, you know, the, the, the battlefields and, and sort of have a probably a little bit irresponsible and dangerous looking back with the amount of ordnance and stuff that was laid around mm. on the floor. But it was good fun and it, it, it whiled away the time. And then I, I think after a while, it was I can remember it being curved. It was like too dangerous and there was all sorts of shenanigans going on. But you know, surprise, it, it certainly, certainly whiled away the time and, 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 and had a good bit of fun, I remember. Record right now. We still have a lot more to cover. So I'm going to... Uh, uh, it's an honour, uh, you know, to... to to have you guys to be involved, to hear your experiences and to share what you have. Um, we hope this September, uh, this year, we hope to do it. And, uh, and I'll tell you, if, we, if, if for, by chance it isn't, we'll have a 30 plus one celebration when you're here. 
Outstanding. Uh, we'll definitely make a big one. If, if it doesn't get together this year, and we are optimistic, if it doesn't, we want to get you back, and we want to get as many of you back as we can. Um, it's good to, you know, it's great to know you guys.